I want to go ahead and welcome Brandy Melendez, 98. She is a graduate from Brown with a degree in psychology, and she entered the human resources field seeking to combine this interest in psychology with the corporate environment. In 99, she began her career at Union Square Technology Group, which was a 30-person IT company, and several years later was acquired by MindShift Technology. Technologies, thank you. Uh, now, MindShift is a 660 person company. It's one of the largest IT outsourcing and cloud service providers serving small and mid sized companies. Her experience includes establishing the human resources function within her growing organization and extensive acquisition experience. In her current role, she is responsible for the entire human resources function, including employee and leadership relation and development, culture transition, organizational development, succession, strategic workforce planning, recruiting, training, the whole gamut. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and her two young children. And she's going to share some of her insights from that human resources world with us today and talk about how that might be affecting those who um, been out less than 10 years and the world of work and entering it. So Brandy, welcome. Thank you very much, Heather, for that introduction. And I'm excited to be here talking about some of the challenges associated with uh, navigating the early stages of uh, one's career. So some of the things we'll talk about today are millennial stereotypes. Um, you know, some of the challenges that new professionals uh, have when they're interacting with more senior professionals and the different perspectives, some of the young alumni difficulties, um, interviewing tips, making the next step the right step if you're making some decisions about what to do next, and then once you've landed the job that you want or the role that you want, um, how to start that new relationship successfully. So what are the stereotypes that we are talking about today? In order to really um, to get into the discussion, we need to sort of address what they are. And um, so, you know, Heather, I think this might be a good place to ask a question about what they are uh, seeing as stereotypes that they are interacting or that they are uh, noticing in their job searches and, you know, and we'll talk about some of the ones that we know are out there right now. Um, so okay, so I'll send that out to everyone and give us your opinion so that we can be sure we're addressing it. Okay, thanks, Heather. So some of the stereotypes um, that, that we see in the workplace these days, um, some of the complaints, really, that we hear from more senior professional, professionals about millennial professionals, they're comfortable with change. They're not satisfied. They feel a sense of entitlement. Um, it's all about them and not their role or responsibilities to the organization they work for. Um, the expectation that they are going to be praised for every small accomplishment that happens and that there's little tolerance for entry-level tasks. Now, it's interesting because some of these things, specifically the, comfort the level of com being comfortable with change, can also have a flip side of positivity. Um, and, you know, sometimes in certain organizations or environments, being really flexible is a very good thing. But mediating that between having that ability to be flexible and also not expecting there to be change all the time um, are some of the challenges that I definitely see uh, with our more junior professionals in the organization. I'm, you know, as, as Heather indicated, within the realm of IT world, and certainly that is an environment that has a lot of learning and change, um, and sometimes what we see is the expectations are really, really um, even exceed what we can, we can do. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really, really important for young professionals to realize is that there is a need for them to um, have realistic expectations about what will happen in the course, in the early courses of their career, and and to be, you know, mindful of that relationship with their employer. Um, so let's talk about um, Heather. Do we have any any ideas that came in uh, about the um, any responses of stereotypes that people are seeing that we didn't touch on there? 
Uh, yeah, there's, you know, a couple of responses of, you know, these can also be good things, optimistic things, and that is so true, and that's, that's definitely how uh, you and I talked about that's, you know, how you're going to handle these issues and talk about how that's great. Um, a couple of things about, you know, not being willing to work long hours, and then what you said about the unrealistic expectations. Another positive thing is, you know, being culture blind. Those are really good points, and, and as I was mentioning, um, there's a flip side to that. So it's, it's and really what we're going to talk about are the ways to focus on the upside, to focus on how those things are positive, if that really is the sentiment. And then some ways to, you know, fight uh, the stereotype. One of them is really about the willingness, you know, in, uh, to pay your dues. Um, and so I have some suggestions about that. One thing is um, to sweat the small stuff. So the way that you respond to requests that you are less than enthusiastic about really does matter. We know, um, certainly employers know and more senior professionals know that in more junior level positions, we're asking you to do something that you might not be jumping up and down to want to do. But the way that you do that work and you're showing your excellence and your commitment and your organization skills and the fact that even those things are done well really goes a long way in terms of fighting a stereotype and more importantly goes a long way in terms of showing your teams, your manager, your organization that you're willing to do what it takes to do a great job at all times. And that leads to the fact that all good things come in time. Um, you use those opportunities to show your excellent work, show that you're looking to improve things, show that you're a team player. Um, that will open up opportunities for uh, earning the right, really, to get more harder, more complex tasks that might turn out to also be more interesting and more challenging for you. So you have to use you know, your your ability to show you've done a good job um, to your advantage and then sort of have those open up the opportunity to do, to do more interesting things. The next real uh, piece of information that I, uh, I think is important to think about is what investment you're making in the role or in the organization or really to your teams. Um, so you have, once you have decided to, to take on a role, there's some goal in there for you and the organization also has um, a reason why they've asked you to do that role. So I always recommend young professionals to have enthusiasm about what you're doing. Um, even if it's not exactly where you want to be yet, be, you know, be knowledge, be thoughtful about what it is you're doing, doing a good job, what that importance is to the organization, and have goals. Either you're going to master a skill that you have, um, you've been offered the opportunity to to show, um, understand that it doesn't always happen right away, but if you're given the opportunities and you're in a role that is going to get you there, having some patience will help. I always say to be honest and earnest about why the role is important to your growth and always remember to understand and demonstrate how that work is important to the organization. It's really important to your future within and outside of the current organization that you're able to do that. Um, you know, understanding what the what the smaller piece that you're currently doing has in the bigger picture is important to your own satisfaction within that role as well. And then uh, demonstrate balance, not entitlement. Um, enthusiasm and ambition and wanting to love your work and progress ra rapidly are really positive traits. Employers want employees like you, and not just because you're awesome and we know you are awesome, but because the best scenario is that was when there is synergy in the relationship overall. So, you know, prior experience, where you went to school, all the other, you know, maybe your networking relationships will have the influence of opening doors for you, but your actions and your attitude influence how you're viewed beyond that. Your actual work um, is is what matters once that door has been opened and once you have that opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about some job search challenges. Um, you know, wh while I go over this, this is another opportunity, I think, Heather, um, for us to talk about what challenges that some of the audience is facing okay. um, as well. Great. So I'll send that a note to the audience. Let us know if there's challenges that we're missing here. Okay. So one of the things that we know is a challenge as you're searching for a new position is your potential lack of experience. If you haven't done it before um, and there are others who have done it before and are you know, competing for the same roles or um, 
you know, is something that you don't have experience with, but you're, you want to learn, you want to get that initial experience, it may be hard to find that first opportunity. Um, you know, if you've had a lot of job changes and short tenure, um, that could can be a challenge in your job search because it shows, um, you know, really a, a lack of proven commitment to an organization or a path. And there may be some really good reasons why these things have happened, which we'll talk about a little bit, but, you know, these are things that we know are challenges for young professionals especially. And really that's, that's one that maybe applies across the board, quite honestly. Um, the, the, you may have, for example, accepted, you know, internships or other types of roles that were short tenured or decided that a role that you accepted was not the right one and moved on in a short period of time. Um, you know, too much of that can be a challenge in explaining to an interviewer or a recruiter and it can be, you know, something that weighs against you in comparison to someone else that has some more um, proven experience or some more tenure, you know, to show some more commitment to an organization. Um, so one thing that I, um, uh, so I guess Heather, do we have any challenges there that we that have come in that we should talk about before we move on? We do have some really great challenges here that I think um, will fit right in with some of the things you're discussing and maybe we hold off to giving a little bit of it, but things like um, what if you're one of a thousand applications? Well, ha you know, most of the jobs I see are all entry level. Um, presumption that a liberal arts education does not teach useful job related skills. So those are things to talk about. So I think you'll set them up and maybe those can be addressed as part of it and anything that's not covered, I'll, I'll bring it back up. Okay, let's let's then go to the, the next part about, and then we'll address those, I guess. Um, so when you're going into an interview, and, and part of these, part of the challenges that you're mentioning are about, um, you know, kind of how you go into this. Um, how do you go into it if I'm one of a thousand, for example? Um, and how do you stand out as one of, the, one of a thousand resumes? One huge thing is preparation. Um, you have to go into an interview or go into, I mean, even from that initial discussion with a recruiter or a response, knowing um, about what you're applying for. So the first step is researching the organization. Um, you should do whatever you can to find out about, you know, via their websites, their career pages. Um, if you have any friends or acquaintances in your, within your network that are familiar with the organization, find out all you can about an organization. Uh, once you're applying to a specific role, make sure you research the role. I can't tell you how many times that someone has had an automated response to something, you know, a job posting, and then have come in or had a conversation with one of the people on my recruiting team and not really known what they were responding to. Um, it really obviously can start, it's not the way to start off. Um, so know what the role is, know what the job requirements are, know what, um, you know, get as much of a sense of the of the um, role as you can from a job description. And again, using whatever you can, networking or other opportunities to find out information. Many companies really do a great job within their websites or articles published, et cetera, um, of communicating what their values are. Find out as much information as you can about the values of the organization. So, uh, you know, that's, and that's, for, for you, because it's important for those things to be aligned, but also so that you go in looking and sounding like you have a real interest and are knowledgeable about what you're interviewing for. And then the last piece, um, you know, that in terms of being prepared are to come with questions. Um, you know, know what your interests are. Um, set up, you know, use the information about the organization, the role and the values to come in prepared with some questions. I think it's okay to have notes, um, you know, prepared with you for an interview. You should certainly know what you want to ask, but it's okay to have something to refer to. Uh, remember, though, um, you know, to, to use them as a reference point and not let it be sort of head down looking at your questions. Um, and, um, you know, that sort of sets you up to be in the right position for when you go into the interview itself. 
And then when you go into your interview, it's really about telling your story. Um, and this again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I have a recruiting team, and so you know, our recruiters often are the first line of discussion before someone would get to a hiring manager for many of our positions. The recruiters that you work with, especially when they're internal to an organization, can have a very big impact on the hiring managers. Um, big influence on the hiring managers. So be ready to tell your story in a way that's attractive to, to potential employers. Um, there's some ways to do that. And again, look at the interview as I you are going in there to tell your story. Let them get to know you a little bit. Let them be able to envision you within their environment or in a role. That's really your goal, you know, from the, the candidate perspective within an interview. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but ask related questions. Um, I talked about the questions that you can prepare in advance, but also as you're having the conversation, utilize the natural opportunities that come up to ask questions as you're going through the conversation. The interview should really be, in the best case scenario, it's a discussion um, versus a Q&A, I think, and use those questions that you sort of prepared and you have in your mind um, during the natural course of that conversation, and certainly, certainly use any information that you're receiving in the interview to ask questions you hadn't thought of that are a natural part of the conversation because that shows your ability to take information in and um, kind of translate it into something meaningful within a discussion, which is an important part of any role. Um, relate your experiences to your job. So this is this is the question, you know, I you know of applying to entry level jobs or where you have a lack of experience or you're one of many applicants, right? Your experiences, even in school, in internships, and other entry levels, can apply to a new role, and you have to be able to pick out how that is. So maybe you uh, you know the role you've had project management um, because you worked on a on an expansive project even in school or in an internship or something else, and you can see how that applies to the role you're applying for. Relate your personal experiences to the job. Show that you can extrapolate the information that you've learned or received and apply it to what's going to be in front of you in the future. Um, the next thing that I think is always a part of telling your story is speaking to any missteps and what you learn from them. So back to our conversation regarding having a lot of, you know, potentially having a lot of short tenure. If you made some bad decisions about the roles you've accepted or you had to do them for some other reason um, or it didn't work out for some, some reason, you know, you should be, I, I always suggest that people are frank about that. Um, tell people how, what you learned and how you are going to apply that knowledge to what happens in the future in this role or wherever you land. Um, it shows that you're, you have the ability to, to, to learn from what's happened in the past and apply it and really be honest about kind of what's happening. Um, another thing to, to be mindful of is, you know, strength, your strengths and your commitment to work hard. Um, you can, you know, in terms of combating the stereotypes, you really need to be able to articulate why the role that you're applying for is potentially the one for you in the future and why you can be committed to it, what you plan to learn, um, your willingness to learn about an organization, your willingness to, to learn about um, a practice or a role, your willingness to move forward. Certainly, as I said before, it's a really important and it's a, and it's a positive trait to want to make progress, but also balance that with your willingness and commitment to an organization. I think this is probably the biggest one in terms of stereotypes that are um, are really prevalent in you know our more senior professional roles. But we really see often is that people really want to learn a skill or a thing, and once they've learned it, then they're looking to move on. Again, this is about the balance and the synergy. It you know employers know that employers know, and they're the ones that um, may be training you to go do something else. But that's not really efficient from a business perspective, right? There's got to be a balance. And we're going to teach you things. You're going to have an opportunity to learn and um, move forward e either here or elsewhere. But there's something in return that you're providing to the employer, and you really should show a willingness to do that. And then the last thing in terms of turning your story that we want to talk about right now is to be yourself. Um, if you go in pretending like something you're not, um, if you, you're trying to show them what you think they want to see, um, it's probably not going to work out in the best. It's because often in interviews, there's something, you know, we see candidates who, 
who we, we think have the skills, but there's something that is not quite fitting or doesn't really make sense. Um, and, and you end up bringing your, you know, we end up bringing that person back to meet with them again because we're trying to figure out what that is. Being yourself right up front can save you some unnecessary rounds of interviewing. If yourself is not really a good fit for them, better to know that sooner rather than later. Um, you know, if, if you're able to convey, a, you know, a natural sense of yourself and certainly the, you know, well-mannered professional side of yourself, we want to see, um, you know, it, it's much better to see if it's going to be a good culture fit. Those are really great points, and I love the way you describe it as your your story, and I think that that really does sort of address, like, if you're one of a thousand, you know, show your, your link to it. Um, do you have any specific things about how to address your background if it's in liberal arts? I mean, you're in a technical field, too. I, I'm sure you face some of those issues. Yes, right. So I have a degree in psychology and went into IT. So yes, I have. Um, <laughs> the thing is, the thing is that um, I mean, I, certainly I'm in HR and IT, so it's relative. The thing about liberal arts is that, especially if you don't have a lot of work experience, and 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 they may some some more senior professionals may not admit this, but they know that what you study in school has a big impact in terms of the knowledge base, certainly. But the biggest thing that you learn in school, because many people go into fields that are not directly related, is you learn how to gain knowledge. You learn how to apply it. You learn how to work with people. You learn how to move forward, especially in a, you know, from, for students who go, go to challenging universities or challenging educational environments. That's the value. I don't think that in many fields, employers really expect you to be able to do the job when you're straight out of school. Um, but you know, you can always choose, you know, aspects of what you've learned from an educational perspective and apply them to, you know, the role. I mean, it's, it, you know, you have to think through it, and understanding the role is really, really important. But I would always find a way to take some project you worked on, some team you were a part of, some, um, you know. You know, real experiences that you have within the educational environment, and, play, and and figure out how that applies to how you are going to be in a professional environment. Does that answer the question, Heather? I think so. I think that does a good job of answering it, and um, I think it also addresses a little bit the next issue of um, you know how do you then take that and make yourself special. It also is makes me think a lot about the question the person asked about second, you know, not just entry level. There seems that there's so much entry level. Um, just from my perspective, I mean, I run the Brown Alumni Job Board, and there are more entry level, but there are definitely jobs out there that say three to five years experience. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder, too, from an HR perspective, I think because a lot of employers know that it's a larger pool that are new grads, if sometimes they don't advertise the job, as entry level, because that just seems like an easy way to um, connect with it, to connect yeah. with employers. Uh, I think, candidates. yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. There's a couple of things going on there. So one, is, you know, and this is just an honest challenge of right now. There are more more in the recent job search history, you know, time frame. There are more people with experience that are accepting more junior level jobs because that's what's available. So there has been some of that. There are some, the other thing is quite honestly, you know, from an HR perspective, we always know that whatever we say are those minimal year requirements, people with less than those requirements are going to apply to the job. Okay. Um, so we, we definitely know that, um, you know, sometimes really do require that you have, um, you have some experience and that, and that's difficult. But, you know, in terms of getting to those jobs, knowing what the prior experience is, is really important. Now, you know, once in a while, people who, you know, are not quote unquote qualified for a job apply and really, um, you know, hit it out of the park in an interview. And if they're not, um, ex you know, accepted for that role, we might bring them in for another one. You know, you want to make it a memorable, you know, this is sort of back to the, the story make it a memorable experience because if it's not this role, it might be a different one or, you know, certainly we've interviewed people for one thing and realized they're not really the right fit for that one, but they made a great impression or um, were very likable, seemed really sharp, 
and we thought, you know, I've thought about that person down the road and when something that was applicable did come up. Mm-hmm. So um, in terms of standing out, you know, I think one of the one of the questions had to do with standing out if you're a thousand. You know, that is that is one of a thousand. You know, just sending your your resume into a um a sort of an auto response thing is hard. I do um suggest that if you're really interested in a position that you try and speak to a person, even if the job posting doesn't say that that's what we're asking you to do. So, you know, call, you know, go to the website, find out who the recruiter is, find out, you know, call the main number and find out who you might speak to um, and, and, and show some diligence. Um, because quite honestly, you know, it's a hiring manager or it's a recruiter that's looking at all those resumes. And they're, you know, taking, depending on the type of job, maybe hundreds or a thousand of resumes and reading them out in some way um, based on criteria that they've predefined. And, and, and it is a very, um, it's not a very individualized process to get them down. Now, usually what happens is they get them down to, you know, some manageable number of resumes of people to reach out to, and then those reach out starts, which is why I say, again, you know, being ready for that first conversation is really important because making a great impression in that first call can get you an in-person interview. And then making exactly. you know, a great impression in that in-person interview obviously takes you to, to the next steps. Mm-hmm. And um, also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it feels much better for a company to to have a referral from somebody inside or from somebody that they know that you know they, that it's a real person as opposed to a piece of paper. So use the networking yeah. resources. And if you're from Brown, there is some great resources. And if you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn and use the Brown. Um, if you use any of the alumni pages, you know there's. 50, 60,000 Brown alumni there. Uh, so search the companies or the industries and you know see if there's someone you can connect with that way. I definitely agree with that. So even if it's it's not a direct, it's not your best friend who's worked at the company, but an acquaintance or someone you know, if you can find an in and a connection and you can get that person to submit your resume to the hiring manager or recruiter, certainly that's great. But even if you're sort of already in the in the in the process of applying for a position, if you can find someone that um, you can that can help you sort of get connected with the right person. That's really really helpful. Um, you know, we consider our referral. We you know internally in my organization and many organizations are like this. We have referral programs. Some of our best hires come from other people within the organization already who have referred someone, and they certainly go to the front of the line. Now that can be a challenge though if you haven't had a lot of professional experience. So you might have to work a little harder to to get to that. As as Heather, you're suggesting. You know, you, you have to work your, your LinkedIn connections. Um, maybe you reach out to someone that you don't know and say, I see you work for this organization. I'm very interested in this position. Um, you know, what are your recommendations for how I might get, make sure my resume gets in front of that hiring manager? Um, people are pretty, or can be very helpful in that way, you know, that you even don't have very personal relationships with. So one other thing that you mentioned earlier, and then we'll go on, was to demonstrate balance um, and th- show enthusiasm and that you have goals and that you have patience. Are there any things that you would recommend to help um, reveal that in an interview? Um, yes, I, I certainly think having examples of where you've taken an you know initiative um, in the past are are good. That's more about you know hey I'm I'm really interested and I'm going to be enthusiastic. But talking about some things that you've done where you have had a long term commitment again you know to a project or item or um, you know something you did that was but that was maybe not quote unquote the most interesting but you learned something from. You know, and is saying, hey, you know, I did this work. I didn't know what I was going to, what I thought about it at first. It was very, maybe it was very administrative. But here's what I learned, and here's how I think that's going to be important for the next thing that I do. Those are, that's a, the way to sort of be able to translate that information. Um, in terms of the commitment piece, I think that, um, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm of the, of the belief that people should address things pretty, pretty directly. I think it's okay to say. I know that you might think that I'm one of these people who's not going to be committed in long term. That's not my plan. My plan is to get into a role where I can really learn, make a contribution to an organization, and be committed to it for some period of time. Now, granted, that commitment, nobody's expecting the, your, you to, anybody to be committing to a 10-year stint, right? But committed, be, you know, articulate that you plan to be committed to where you are when you're there. 
um, is, is my recommendation. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So then the last thing I want to say, I think, about the interviewing is um, <laughs> when you are in the interview or when you have, um, you know, been given the opportunity, if you're asked about, if you've exhausted all your questions, uh, great. If you haven't, you know, been sort of given the opportunity to ask the questions, take that time at the end of the interview to, to raise any of them that you didn't get addressed. If you're asked to give questions, to ask questions, or if you're asked if you have any questions, make sure you come up with at least one. Um, that hasn't already been there. And those can be about logistical items, like, you know, what are the next steps? Um, they can be, you know, kind of what is the time frame type of questions without being too too aggressive about it. Um, and then if you're interested in the position, the person should, you should leave that interview, the person interviewing you or the people interviewing you should know that you're interested. There should be no question in their mind about whether you're interested in the role. Certainly, you don't need to be, you know, have decided that this is the place for you in that one meeting. But if you're interested, they should know it. And then I always do, um, and it may sound a little old school, I'll just say it, but <laughs> um, I do believe that it, it makes a difference to send a thank you note following up an interview. Um, you might go a little bit more in depth um, referring to the things that you talked about um, in, an, in a place that you think you're really interested in, but I think it's a follow-up thank you is always important. Again, back to my point of before, um, you know, you may not, you may have interviewed for a position and you may not get that one, but someone in the process might remember you. You might meet them down the road in a different situation, so you always want to leave everything on a really positive note. Mm -hmm. That's a really great one. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay, so let's move on now. Let you are getting the job. You have found a role. Um, uh, you've been, you know, offered a position and you're hired. Some things that we that we thought, you know, were are really interesting um, about understanding the relationship with Team U and um, and your potential manager. Um, so some tips for create to to making your new career a success. So if you look at this this graph, which I thought was really interesting, um, some of the differences between millennials and non-millennials who manage them. Uh, meaningful work, much more important for millennials. You guys knew that already. Um, high pay, less important, um, but but very important to the non-millennials. A sense of accomplishment is up there versus uh, with the with the non-millennial millennials. Sorry, and then the the high responsibility differences I thought were really astonishing. So so you know in your the people who are potentially managing you, they want to be responsible for things and 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 the sense of accomplishment is less. And what I think this is very true in what we see. You know, people want to do something that's meaningful. The pay, maybe they're willing to, if they can, if they have the ability to, they're willing to uh, potentially not be so focused on the pay for the meaningful work um, and the sense of accomplishment. And the responsibility is less important. So it's interesting to just kind of have that in your mind as you're working with your, your future managers or your current managers. Um, so in terms of getting on the path, a positive path in your career direction, um, we talked about this a little bit, but I just want to reinforce, you know, have a willingness to embrace the fact that some administrative tax, tasks are important to the organization, whether or not they are the, so exciting and interesting to you. Really learn why that is important. Understand how it fits into the, to the bigger picture for the organization, and then that will give you more of a sense of, of accomplishment about the work that you're doing. Um, offer your opinion at the right time. So as I, you know, we see this often with people who are really engaged and really smart and sharp. You know, there's a jump in to, to give your opinion or a jump in to make an assessment and, and suggest change, per, you know, perhaps. Really, before you are offering your opinion, certainly when you're asked your opinion, you, sh you, should, you should give it. But uh, make sure you understand the history of what you're talking about as much as you can. Make sure you understand all the different things going on as much as you can. And offer your opinion at the right time. And be aware of the perceptions um, is part of that. Um, you know, be aware that you might be stepping on somebody's toes when you make that suggestion. Um, do it in a way that's, that's thoughtful and do it in a way that's respectful of whatever the work that has already happened has been. And then, so, you know, again, in terms of building your career, um, as you move along this road and you are making decisions about the, the future, or if you're in a position now um, that you're making some assessments about, you know, should you enter a new field? Is this the wrong role for you? Some things to think about. Um, 
So how do you know when to consider leaving? I, I'll call these, these, these three things really are a lot about energy. Um, if you're not good at something, it's really hard to be positive about it. If you really have tried something, you've given it, you know, you've been trained, you've been in the environment, you've tried to do it and you just don't have, you know, something isn't clicking, you're not good at it, that's a, that's a time to consider maybe this is not the right thing for you. If it sucks the life out of you, um, you're not looking forward to going to your, into your role every day, to work every day, you're not looking forward to the kind of work you're, you're doing, you're not energetic about it, um, it's very hard to continue that way. And that's a, a time that you might consider and doing something different. And if there's an imp impossible culture fit, um, you know, the, you're very focused on on social responsibility, and the company is only focused on other things. Um, if if that feels like it's not something that fits right with you, even though you've had a position, then it's important to think about what to do next. Once you've had, you know, I, I think here is an important thing. I want to be clear that you know you you have to have given it a reasonable um, sort of amount of time before you start making these assessments. Um, and again, these things, these three things, not being good at it, sucking the life out of you, and it being an impossible culture fit, are really about the energy. It's if you can't have positive energy about what you're doing, it's very difficult to to do a great job and to be considered for the the things, the great things that you want to have moving forward. So if, assuming you want to be in a position to make a change, um, how do you get yourself there? Um, volunteering for projects in an area of interest. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about timing, about what I think is sort of the minimal time commitment in, in being in a role. And, and I, what I say might, might be surprising, so I'm prepared for that. But uh, um, So I say that when you take a role, a new role, you should be prepared when you take it to make a commitment of 18 months. And I'll explain that 18 month time frame um, now. The first piece of it is the fact that most employees, especially if you're, you have less experience in a position, will take three to six months to really be trained and fully ramp up into their position. And when I say ramp up, I mean to the point where you're, the utilization or the, the person is really able to do their job um, at the at the rate at which the employer is looking at it. This is really from the employer perspective. So there's some training, you know, kind of curve, learning curve. There's some ramp up. And in three to six months, depending on the role, then the person is really fully in the role and they're really productive in that role, making that contribution to the organization that we talked about before, right? This is a synergy part of it. You've been trained to learn, so you learned something, now you're doing it for the organization. The organization needs that. That's why they've hired you. Um, in that six to 12 months area is where you, your side of it is that you have really learned now how to do it. And so you should get more efficient. You should be able to um, do it more quickly. And then you get the opportunity. Now is when you have the opportunity to potentially have more room in your day or more room in your work life to volunteer for other things. Um, so you might have some time on your hands or you might have some capability because you're not learning quite as much at, the, at that time potentially to say to a teammate, to your manager or, um, you know, or, or someone even in another group, I have some capability. Do you need any help here? I'm really interested in what you're doing. Um, once you've mastered the basics, you can offer to do something in draft. So, you know, managers certainly appreciate it if somebody says, hey, I know this is some thing that you do that um, I'd like to take a, try and take a stab at. Uh, can we schedule? Can I take a stab at it and let's schedule some time to review my work? Right. Um, you have to have been be able to do your role. Uh, you have to be able to demonstrate that you've done it well. And this again goes back to what we said before about about doing you know showing excellent work even in things that might be you might be less enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic about. Once you've demonstrated that you can do a great job, that's when people will give you the opportunities to try other things. So, you know, this is a time where you can volunteer for projects in an area of interest um, and potentially get the opportunity to, to stretch and flex into the things that you want to do next. Um, professional organizations are also a great way to, to become knowledgeable about something when you don't have a lot of hands-on experience. So read articles, um, you know, LinkedIn groups, um, organizations as well. There are all ways to become knowledgeable about something and then use that and apply that knowledge to areas that you might volunteer in. Um, people want to, to, to know that you're, you're going to be helpful or they like to see enthusiasm and helpfulness. Um, 
So then back to the time frame. You know, in the six to 12 months time frame, you, you know, have theoretically been able to demonstrate that you're doing a great job. You know, many co- companies don't really consider promoting someone out of their current role until they've seen that they've done a good job in their in, in what they've been trained and gotten some positive benefit to the organization out of that. And then they're thinking, you know what, this person is doing a great job. What are the next things for them potentially within our organization? Theoretically, also, in, you know, in that time frame around, you know, by about a year, you should have had an opportunity, at least a, a formal, one formal opportunity to um, have a, your, a review or an evaluation or a discussion about where you are in terms of from your manager's or team's perspective and where you want to be now that you've learned about the organization. So that's why I say that the 18-month period, because you really have to give yourself time to establish yourself, you know, be a contributor, be assessed, and, and have the discussion about now that you know the organization where you would like to go. Um, and then the next thing we'll talk about is how to not burn bridges and continue the stereotypes. So this is also, you know, we talked about the minimal time commitment. But if you decide that, you know, you don't see the opportunities that you think that you uh, were hoping for or there's some other thing that's not working for you and you decide to find another opportunity, it's really important to think about um, how you choose to do that. Always respect whatever the company policies are. Traditionally, it's, it's about a two-week resignation period if you choose to resign. In that time frame, you should always, always continue to do your best work. You should help in transition wherever it's needed. So if you're transitioning the work to someone else in the interim before they've re, you know, replaced you, et cetera, do your best job at that. Um, leave it on a good note. If something was not going well, um, you know, if it's a situation where the life was being sucked out of you (laughs) and you've chosen to leave for that reason, um, you should always still leave on a high note. No company bashing or manager bashing or any of those types of things because later on down the road, we talked about networking before, one of those people that you're working with, even though this wasn't the right role, might be someone who's your connection into another thing or someone who's hiring for a position. So you always want to, you know, show decorum and leave on a po- in a positive way. Um, it's, it's, it, it, you'd be surprised how small the world can be, and um, often people sort of take this time to, to, to show something that they didn't show in the, in the time before, and it turns out to hurt them in the, in the long run. I think that's a really good point, and I appreciate you taking the time because I think it's, it's easy to say, oh, I, I want to look for a job, and we're going through that. But it's also important to realize that you need that experience, and maybe you are having to step back and take entry level, even though you have three to five years of experience, um, you know, to build those relationships and to build that time, um, even though if it, you know, it may be so frustrating or you know, maybe that's what's going on in the world of work today. Um, I did want to share a story from that, um, you know, we have a tool here called Brunet, which is, you know, for informational interviewing. Um, you know, there's LinkedIn, there's lots of uh, postings and internships, and an alum who's been very helpful and gracious and often, um, you know, answers questions to young alumni and students. Uh, and he was contacted by a young alum asking if he could do an externship, and you know he this guy went to bat for him, got him a job, and then when the HR person contacted, yeah, he was like, oh, I'm sorry, I took another job. <laughs> no, thank you, no follow up. Um, and this alum's gonna remember who he is, and he, uh, you know, it took some work on our side to get him to come back and post more jobs and to, you know, be part of the organization. So it does come back around. And that what made me think about that, too, is someone asked a question following up about the thank you notes. Uh, you know, is an email appropriate? What's the best way? Do you send it to everyone you interviewed with? Just talk about the etiquette a little bit. Sure. I think email certainly is appropriate. It doesn't have to be, you know, a a personal note. Although I have seen that happen, and it is a nice touch, I'll say, for something that you really, really want, you know, I I wouldn't say it's a bad idea. I think email is perfectly fine. It's quick. You can do it, you know, within a reasonable time frame. 
Um, I generally do say that you should send something to everyone you've interviewed with. They will, you know, kind of reconvene and talk about you later. <laughs> so, um, you know, if one of them has received it and one of them has not, that may be an awkward situation. Um, and, um, you know, I think, as I said, I always recommend doing one. Thank you for your time. You know, it was, it was great to learn about the company. Please let me know if you have any questions. But if you can include in that um, email some specific things that is clear to the person reading it that were, that was not, it should not be like a template thing that you send to everyone because it, that's really obvious, right? You know, it, it was a pleasure to learn about the insert specific things you talked about um, at, at your organization. I look forward to the next steps, those types of things. It, it's much better. Um, you know, even, even if you're not, you know, if you, if you leave the interview and you feel like, you know what, that's not the place for me, it's, I wouldn't spend a lot of time, you know, going to that effort, but I would send a few sentence thank you, um, you know, telling the person that you appreciated their time and perspective. Mm -hmm. what Were there about, any other questions, Heather? Yeah, yeah, there was a couple more that came through. Um, what are some ways that you can show that you're a team player? What are ways that you can, uh, you know, show that you're going to be committed to the current organization and work for their goals? Yeah, I think talking about, you know, if you have them, certainly talking about um, examples of having done that in the past are great. And it doesn't have to be within a professional environment. Like being a team player can come out of a lot of different areas. Um, you know, showing an example where, where the thing you're working on, you were not the lead, it was not your thing, but you made a contribution and, and showing how that contribution helped something be successful is a great way. Um, if you don't have, I mean, I, it's, hard, it's hard for me to imagine there are not some examples like that, but if you don't have one, you know, again, I, I think it's good to talk about your, what your plan is, right? Here's what I would like to do. I would like to, I would like to become a part of a team. I would like to, you know, spend the next year really learning about something. I, I enjoy working in a team environment, et cetera. Um, and here's what I hope to see happen in my next role is a way to do it as well. But if you can come up with a concrete example of a way that you contributed in a group as part of a team, um, you know, on a project that you were not the lead on or doing something that was maybe not as um, glitz and glamour, but was important and you can recognize it, I think that, that achieves the goal. Mm -hmm. um, I actually pulled this back up because uh, I think it relates a little bit to what you're saying. It's just you know, also being aware of the culture and the people that you're interviewing with or negotiating with because a question has come in about negotiating salaries. How do you go about negotiating salaries? I will uh, give a plug that in the fall we did do a webinar on uh, negotiation, specifically salary negotiation, but it would be great to get Brandy's take on this. So negotiating salary is a tricky one, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think you have to be knowledgeable about what the what the you know, anticipated salary is for the role. Um, it's actually a good point I, I didn't think to mention, but you may be asked this on your first interview, right, um, ballpark. You know, like what is it, the, the compensation that you're looking for? A question like that might come up. So you should have thought about that before you get there. Um, I do think that if you are made an offer and um, it's not meeting your expectations and you have a realistic view and, and not, you know, you have some knowledge about what the going rate is, you know, the time to ask or the time to have the to do the negotiation is before you've accepted the job, right? Um, no one, you know, it's, it's an awkward thing. I don't think that anyone really faults anybody for trying to do their best at this point, you know, when they're accepting a role. You want it to be something that you, you, you want to, you know, everybody wants to go into it in a positive, on a positive note. We don't want you to accepting a position you're really unhappy with the salary with, and you don't want that either because in six months you're going to be looking for something else, right? So right. Um, I think the, 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 the part that's challenging is realistic expectations, especially if you're not in, um, in a current role. So a lot of what we do when we are sort of on the recruiting side looking at this information is we ask people what they're making now, right? And so that can, that can if you don't have a lot of experience or if you've been way off in your current salary, that can, that can hurt you. Um, so you, you have to think about, you know, here's what I'm making now. You have to know kind of what the going rate is for what it is that you are trying to get into. And then you have to do a little bit of a gut check on what's the most important thing. Is the experience, 
you know, back to your your the you know the the graphic that we're looking at now, um, you know, is the sense of accomplishment and the meaningful work what what value does that have to you compared to what you're being offered? Um, Did you have other other things that you said in the seminar that that um, that would be helpful for the, the audience to hear? Um, I think there was a couple of nice graphics and a couple of resources for researching um, interviewing uh, researching salaries that they might want to look up, and it'll be on the um, alumni webinars. And it was done by Sarah Venance and Goldberg, so they might just want to do a quick push through that sure. to get that information. Um, and I'm sorry, I got a little distracted because there was a couple of other questions coming in, and they're all a little related to internships. But uh, you and I had had a conversation about, you know, um, being offered constant internships even though you've been out a while. And someone saying, "What if I've been out and I want to get back to a different field and I want to take an internship, but um, you know, I'm getting some pushback because I'm not a student." Um, I think that. That's all tricky, but you know, because there's a lot of talk about um, the world of work and paid work and not paid work. I don't. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. So, I mean, well, on the on the internship, if you're not a student, organizations actually do have. There are some requirements around around that. So, it's got to be a paid internship if you're not a student. <laughs> so, that might be some of the pushback from from yeah. the work perspective. <laughs> Um, yeah, they could get in trouble um, if they hire you right. and they're not paying you. Exactly. Right. 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 So there is a, a technicality there. But in, in general, I think an internship, you know, if you can do it, right, take an internship, and not everybody is in a position to be able to do that. If you can take an internship and it's going to, you know, be beneficial to you to get you the experience that you need for the for the long term uh goals, I think it makes sense. I do think that um, if you do internship after internship, you run the risk of what we said before, and you'll have to be able to explain why you made that choice, or that that was the only thing available to you at the time, and you thought that it was better to do that than not be learning and moving forward, um, because it can look like a chronic internship situation, right? Um, and I think if you can, you can explain, listen, you know, I was I was really trying to. Um, find a full-time role or in a certain field and it wasn't available and I thought this would be a great opportunity to learn then and that's why you know I went through these and I'm very much looking forward to the next steps and, and moving beyond the internship part of life. But an organization who's got some slated um, opportunities for internships for students will likely not do an unpaid internship for someone who's not a student for the reason I said initially. I would also like to just give a shout out to this question that if you have some work experience, even if it's not back in the field, you can go, you know, and look at maybe a more entry level position, but don't sell yourself short. You have great experience now, you have great skills. Again, you just need to really look at how do I show connections between what I've been doing and what they're doing and how can I show some examples of past experience of those skills. Um so you've given a lot of great information. Um, I am going to laugh, Brandy, because I did just hear a big siren behind you. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is the first one, though, so we've done a good job. Uh, you've given a lot of great information. I did ask you for some resources, and these were a couple that you had recommended. Can you talk about these for a second? Sure. So, um, so Lean In, I know, is very popular, but it's also very pertinent to, to items that are related to um, to how you approach your career. I mean, I think it, it's been, I'll, I'll caveat that it's been a little bit focused on sort of women within the workplace, but I think it's very important also for men in the workplace, any young professional, anybody who's going to, you know, has someone in their life in the workforce, anybody who might manage someone later on, um, really different interesting ideas about about how the thing, the dynamics that go on within the workplace, some of the cultural implications, and some of the things that happen to be aware of as you are embarking upon your career or at different stages in your career. The other one is humanworkplace.com, 
And this is a person called Liz Ryan, and you can follow her on LinkedIn as well. But um, she has this sort of um, this, this set of materials and, and does um, articles about reinventing work for people, um, a lot about job search and the whole person. She has a lot of, you know, sort of off the beaten path ideas about, you know, how to go into an interview, how to, do, you know, address some of the questions that you guys had, negotiate your salary. Um, you know, she is actually very much, um, you know, outspoken about the perceptions of non-millennials, of millennials, and focusing on the positive aspects of that, of the, the, the stereotypical traits that are associated with millennials. So I think the, a lot of interesting reads here, um, a lot of advice about career searches at different stages, et cetera, mm -hmm. that I wanted to share. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, just in terms of resources, uh, we are coming to the end, but I do want to let people know that through the Brown Alumni Careers, we do have a lot of um, education articles, connections out there that we try and give you. Um, this is our website. Some of the services that we offer um, include resources for networking. Um, there's Brunette. There's ways to get informational interviews. There's uh, you know connections to understanding uh, how to use LinkedIn and just general ideas about that and ways to connect you with clubs or things to just help you uh, better connect with the Brown community and the world of work. Um, so there are some job hunting tips and tools. Uh, we have obviously um, the webinar series, but in addition to that, uh, we have a coaching referral program if you really need to take a deeper dive into your career development or have get to the next step and, um, you know, overall development areas. If you want to do some more assessment, think about where you are. Um, we, uh, two of those new programs that I wanted to highlight is we have this Alumni Career Spotlight Series, and it's a great way of learning about different careers and what were some of the steps that people took. And also, as we talk about interviewing and all these difficulties, we have an interviewing tool. It's a mock interviewing. So you choose questions that you're having trouble with. You practice them. It tapes you. You can listen to it. You can count the number of ums that you do. Mine's always pretty high. And use that to help you along the path. Brandy has given us a lot of great information. She has kindly um, given her time back to Brown, and I really appreciate that. If you uh, want to get in touch with her, you're interested in MindShift, there's her information. If you have more questions for me or the career programs, uh, please feel free to contact us. And just to let you know, uh, this year we're offering one more. Um, and uh, we're going to talk with Karen Alcott. She's calling it Leaning into Innovation, uh, talking about how she's had a couple of really interesting, exciting career moves along the way. And basically, she's you know always looked for you know what's new, what's exciting, what's going on out there. She's worked and founded some nonprofits. She's been in the you know high tech. She worked for Microsoft. So I think that'll be a fun, interesting conversation. And I hope that you will get a chance to join us. So Brandy, thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say as, before we sign off? No, please. thank you everyone and uh, good luck in your searches. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye.